Hey everyone, and welcome back to Small Steps Big Change. Today's guest is environmental justice warrior, Wawa Gathiru. Wawa and I are both very lucky to be esteemed alumni of the University of Connecticut. I met Wawa at UConn, not when I was on campus, but years later when I returned with a speaker. Her passion for life and her energy around climate justice was something that I just could never forget. I'm so looking forward to sharing Wawa's story with you today. I hope you really enjoy it. Welcome to Small Steps, Big Change, the podcast where we meet extraordinary people who have used small steps to help create big change. I'm your host, Drew Sullivan. In August of 2020, after years of alcohol and cocaine use, I hit rock bottom. I knew at this moment that I had no choice but to get sober. Through lots of hard work and dedication, I made that a reality. I have to admit, I thought that this would fix everything and that a life filled with happiness would just follow. But sobriety was only the first step for me. I had to be sober before I was ever going to rebuild my life and recover all that was lost. I kept going, focusing on the next right move, or as I call it, the next small step. I then took the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one. Every day is a journey for me, and I now believe that I'm in the middle of the most beautiful recovery story of all time. What I have learned is that my story has a lot in common with anyone looking to make big changes in their life. That's why it is time that we work together to make big things happen. Each week on this podcast, I will introduce you to a friend who has used small steps to help create their big change. We are all going through something, and it is my goal that by sharing our stories and bringing vulnerability and empathy to the forefront, we can learn from each other and take the small steps that are needed to create big change. Wawa Gathero is a climate justice storyteller motivated to uplift the voices of those most impacted by the climate crisis. She has become the voice of her generation using the power of social media to share how communities of color and women had been adversely affected by climate change and the racist roots of the environmental movement. Wawa is also the founder of Black Girl Environmentalist, a Rhodes Scholar at the University of Oxford, a Narrative Fellow at the All We Can Save Project, and a recent Revolutionary Power Fellow at the U.S. Department of Energy where she worked under the first ever Deputy for Energy Justice to integrate energy justice in the federal landscape. She is also the youngest member of the Earth Justice Council and the first Black person in the history to receive the Rhodes, Truman, and Udell scholarships. Hi, Wawa, and welcome to Small Steps, Big Change. First and foremost, let's get a good pronunciation on the real way that you say your first name. Yes, well, I'm so excited. Thank you so much for inviting me on your podcast. I love any opportunity I get to talk to you. So getting to have this conversation and have other people get to listen in and hopefully learn something new from us is a really amazing opportunity. So like you said, my name is Wawa. So my full name is Wujiko. Wawa is a nickname that, you know, friends call me and I am 100% okay and fine with that nickname. And my last name is Gaveru. I am Kenyan. That is uh, where my name comes from. And yeah. Awesome. Well, I like to just check in first. How are you? How is it going? How is your summer? I guess it's even better. It has been such a tumultuous summer, to be honest. I spent the first half of the summer in the UK and then I moved to DC. As you know, it was my first experience with my own apartment in the state. Ooh. Uh, so I had no, not a good time. Yeah. So it was difficult. Facebook marketplace is now my favorite place in the whole world. I still haven't disconnected from constantly checking on there every day for knickknacks and such, but I'm in a much better place in regards to like having a furnished apartment. I got two cats. I've always wanted to get cats and a dog. So the dog will be pending in the next couple of years, but that meant so much to me because for me, I know a lot of people are always like, what does success mean to you? And for me, really being able to have my own space with like cats has been something that I've wanted my entire life and my parents never let me. So I just been really happy enjoying my time with them, playing with them and exploring BC and getting to meet so many new people. So it's been a yeah. really good, a good summer. How about you? I had a good summer. 
I had a chance to spend a lot of time with my niece and nephew, which was something that because of COVID and because of them being based on the West Coast, we don't get to do that often. So my partner, Brad, and I had a really nice chance to spend time with our niece and nephew, uh, which in turn also allowed us to spend a lot of time with my sister and brother-in-law, which was really, really great. We also got to spend time with extended family and spend time up at the beach up in Maine and Kenny Bunkport, where my parents are. We also got to go see Brad's family in California. So there was really a lot of family time and a lot of reconnecting. I have found that as I get deeper and deeper into a life that doesn't involve drugs and alcohol, I'm able to form stronger and more authentic relationships based on deeper connection with people. And so I'm really just focusing on those interactions and, and really being able to make up for time that I had lost. So today we're going to discuss a good amount around who Wawa is. But I'd really like to start with family. You know, you are the daughter of two Kenyan immigrants and you have two sisters and a brother. Can you share a little bit more about your childhood and anything that you think would be really helpful to paint the picture of how you grew up? I mean, my family and I were very, very close. And my sisters are some of my favorite people on the whole planet. Definitely like soulmates in that realm of things. It's so interesting. I feel like I'm at a point in my life where I'm like now learning more about my parents outside of being just mom and dad, but as individuals that had whole lives before I showed up. And that's been a real treat, but I grew up in a pretty strict household. My parents are very traditional African immigrant parents. Growing up, um, we weren't allowed to do sleepovers. We weren't really allowed to have people over. I'm trying to think like exactly, like we did Kumon, like Kumon was a math and reading program. So we spent a lot of time really feeding into like education and being really closely connected with our community. So we grew up in Putnam and Pomfret, Connecticut, very small towns, towns that don't have a lot of black people, folks of color in general, or other immigrants and Kenyan immigrants specifically. So we spent a lot of time in Worcester, Massachusetts, especially on the weekends. In an interesting way, I consider Worcester home as well, just because I know the area so well. And that's where I really got to learn more about my culture and being community with my other aunts and uncles and cousins, as well as just like folks that you call aunts and uncles, because, you know, we, we're all in a similar situation. So very, very conservative, strict household, but lots and lots of love. We weren't allowed to watch TV growing up for most of the time. So I think my love specifically of more creative endeavors, like reading um, and writing and singing and writing my own music and playing piano and guitar, I had so much time to dive into that as a kid. And I spent so much of my time exploring that in the outdoors where, you know, like leads into my whole environmental climate love that I have. So I, I am really thankful for all the opportunities I had growing up to just be really explorational, not being bound to like, I don't know, like video games and TV. That just wasn't my upbringing. So I feel like I had a more like, traditional opportunity to figure out a little bit more about myself outside of the things that I feel like a lot of kids may spend their time doing nowadays. Totally. Yeah. I love that. And you were close with your siblings too, right? Like were you close in age? Yeah. So my little sister is only a year younger than me. Oh man. Uh, yeah. So a year and four months, which is really interesting because we were basically raised like twins. I mean, if you look at any photos of us Growing up, we would have the same outfits. She actually at some point got taller than me and is still taller than me, but everyone thought that I was the younger. Sister. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that ended up causing some arguments, you know, later on in life, especially when I turned 18, 19. And my little sister was like, well, I guess I'm turning 18 now. And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. you're 21. You're probably right. a big one, right? Exactly. Because of that, we always have been so close. And I think in a lot of ways, we had a lot of those quote twin tendencies, even though we weren't. So that was, that was a real joy. And now actually spending a lot of time and meeting people that were only children, I'm realizing how grateful I was to have my little sister and then have my oh, older right. sister who actually went to UConn too. So she was a senior when I was a freshman. So when I think of like, my success and my experience at UConn and it being this whole transformative experience, a lot of it was due to her because she told me 
all about things. She knew what I would like, what I didn't. And she would point me in the direction of classes and organizations. So I feel like once I got there, I had a good understanding of like what spaces on campus would be good for me. And I went from there. Thank you for sharing that about your family. I always find your story around your childhood extremely interesting. I want to jump to UConn, as this is something that obviously both of us have in common as we are both alumni of University of Connecticut, the Storrs campus. And for those that don't know too much about UConn, it's pretty big, especially for the location that it's in and, and being in the rural area of Connecticut. And I think everyone goes through their time in college, but especially at UConn, with the opportunity to experience so much. There's always a club to join, an event to go to, an opportunity to get involved, leadership positions, you name it. There's never a lack of opportunity to try something new. And I have many of those moments and experiences that I will hold with me for the rest of my life. One that I always look back to is my time that I worked with Gina Oriema, the women's basketball coach at Connecticut. I had the opportunity to work with him on his brand, and I had the opportunity to work with him on his charitable efforts through the B Foundation. All of those experiences really helped me today as well, in the sense that I believe that I learned a lot of my ability to organize and bring people together and help people see a common goal through those experiences. My question for you is, if you could look at your time at UConn, are there any specific moments or experiences that you believe you'll never forget? Oh my goodness. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there's so much that you said that I can talk about, but directly answering that question, it's so interesting. The other day I was going through my photos and I was going through this like weird, not weird, but it was just like in comparison to the rest of my life, this weird period of time after I won Rhodes reading the messages that I had received in the photos. And I was like, even now I forget how big of a deal it was and like what I was feeling in those moments. And it's crazy. It's only been like two and a half years, almost three years since that point. So actually, I don't know if I had told you this before, but right before going to Yukon, I had been away in Thailand for a year. So I had oh, done cool. um, so you did a gap year. No. So it was my senior year. So um, the USC department has this program called the Kennedy Lugar Youth Exchange and Study Program. They send 65 students to countries with high Muslim populations. It's like a cross-cultural one-year exchange situation. And I was in Thailand. And that entire year, I had already finished all my requirements in high school. So my job that year was to just be culturally immersed, learn the language, make relationships, et cetera. I had no requirements in regards to like real academics outside of like passing my courses. So going into UConn, into like you said, this massive institution that, you know, my whole life I had seen as being a place where you could do anything and make anything out of yourself. I put myself in this mindset of, if not now, then when? In Thailand, I felt like I had learned how to say yes, even when I didn't want to. Like I would just say yes to everything. And I was like, I'm in Thailand. I'm here for a year. This is a life in a year. Let's make the most out of it. And then going to Yukon, I brought that same mindset. So I feel like in a lot of ways, I'm trying to like bring myself back into that concept of like, just say yes to everything. Yukon, that entire experience, I didn't know what I was doing half of the time. I <laughs> used to be such a planner. I mean, going into UConn, because I had that entire year of like not a ton of like academic stimulation, I made this document. I was such a nerd. I made this document, a four-year plan where I went semester by semester. Of course you did. Of what classes I wanted to take, what grades I wanted from the classes, what organizations I wanted to join, what positions I wanted to do, what research labs. I mean, it was in depth. It was over 20 pages long. Absolutely crazy. And... I went to UConn, I followed the plan the first semester, and then I just let go. It's like, listen, like, this is not a time for you to bind yourself to opportunities when you don't even know what's out there. So I was like, just say yes to everything, be open to everything. And I feel like that was the biggest takeaway and perhaps one of the biggest life lessons I've learned and will hopefully continue to like lean on. So I actually went to UConn and I went in as a healthcare management major. 
I don't think I really had any idea what that meant or what the coursework entailed, but it definitely was not what I wanted to do in life. I actually really don't think I knew yet what I wanted to do in life. And so I have to say that I really wish that one thing I walked into college with, or at least someone that had told me while I was there, is this idea that we are allowed to change our minds. We are allowed to pivot. We are allowed to adapt, evolve. We are allowed to pave our own way. And I think that at the time, I was afraid of doing. And I'm a little sad about you know the fact that that wasn't something that was shared with me in a bold way, because I do believe that it limited me in really taking advantage of the academic opportunities that I could have had. Instead, I stayed in a major that I wasn't happy with, that major that I wasn't interested in, that I wasn't passionate about. And what's sad about the whole situation is, is that college, as everyone knows, changes you. So when you walk into the university setting with an idea of what you want to be, it's kind of a farce because who you become after four years is so different than the person you walked in as. And so it really makes sense that your major can change along that journey as well. I mean, don't you agree? Absolutely. And you know what's so interesting and what I should have said earlier in like briefly talking about home life and things of that sort is I have lots to say about where I grew up and my feelings about where I grew up and <laughs> how, how I'd like to like stay a part of the community and things of that sort. But me going to Thailand and then my mindset going into college was really an existential one. Now, 16, you know, I don't want to always keep bringing it back to climate, but it really is such a big part of my life. When I started learning more about the climate crisis and the stakes of not solving this issue, I had an existential crisis. I was, you know, 15 and 16, wondering whether or not my future was guaranteed. And I never had thoughts like this. At the same time, I was really frustrated because I felt like I had grown up with the same exact people. The people I had met, you know, in preschool were the same people I was about to graduate with. And I was just really frustrated. Additionally, because, you know, I grew up a bit sheltered with my parents. My parents are very protective love them so much. And I understand a little bit more growing up as to why they were that way. But I just knew that there was more out there to learn from people that were doing the work that I felt like I didn't even know how to articulate, but I knew that some sort of action, being a part of movements was where I needed to be because I just couldn't sit in like apathy and like all this anxiety that I was getting. So like me deciding to go to Thailand, I'd even tell my parents that I was applying. Um, huh. I just told huh. them that I got accepted. And I was like, I can either go to Thailand for a year and a month or not. And like, they actually allowed me to go like literally three days before departure. It was quite dramatic. Wow. Uh, so like, I think my lens of like going into Yukon and like in a lot of ways being like ravenous and like the ways that I wanted to get involved, it's because I was just so... And I feel this way still, like so desperate to find different ways to connect with people that also felt this urgency. And like, I wanted to be around people that also wanted to like find different ways to like tap into resources and just do the things that like maybe in our small towns we weren't able to do. So I feel like that's an important part of my story that I feel like I should put out there. Yeah, that uh, you found your tribe that like wasn't your family. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it seems like, because you said also before, like you didn't have as many friends. You did a lot of stuff as a family. You didn't have those sleepovers. You didn't do this. You didn't do that when you were growing up. That in a way, like probably the same way in which I gravitated towards like the fraternity and going to parties. And like, again, it's not that like I made a conscious decision to be a little more reckless and you just chose to do something that was going to help you in the future. But it's like, you are faced with decisions when you get to any new community or you're in any new setting. And I think, as you said, especially at UConn, I felt the same way. We walk in and it's like, the world is your oyster. And it's like, but it really is. And it's like on this small scale level around, it's a mini world in the sense that there's like, you can join this club, you can join that club, you can eat this today, you can eat that today. Like you have all these options that are in front of you. And I think that we're always kind of faced with those opportunities 
I'm not talking about opportunities of like, here's a great job. And, you know, do you want to take it? But it's more like, there is an opportunity in front of you. And this is going to shape the next four years of your life, the next 10 years of your life. What choice do you make? And do you make the choice of, I'm going to tiptoe throughout UConn for four years. I'm going to run throughout UConn for four years. Like I'm going to take risks throughout UConn for four years. So you clearly made the decision that you were going to take things as they come, but also obviously go for things that are important to you as well. And it was kind of definitely, it feels like a healthy balance between the two around, you made a face. I wonder if that's really what it was, or do you think there were times that you like didn't balance it? I don't think I balanced it, which is so interesting. If you were to reach out to all the mentors and friends that I made in college, in the midst of what I hope to be like, great things they'd have to say about me. Something that would always come up is Wawa has a tendency to spread herself extremely thin. She hmm. can do it, but it's not a healthy balance for her. And she knows that. And that was something that I really, really struggled with undergrad. Come graduation, I knew what burnout was. I had experienced burnout during breaks or just different times where I was like staying up to study for exams on and on and on. But like upon graduation, I really figured out what burnout was. I think like, honestly, the pandemic and quarantine specifically being back at my parents' house for almost a year, like it was like 11 months and having to sit with myself. I had been so extremely busy for four years. I hadn't even had time to like check in with myself genuinely. And it was only then that I realized that I was tired. I was totally so emotionally tired. I had never asked myself how I was doing. I was always in a lot of ways still am that person that was always, how is this person doing? How's this person doing? Is this thing working? Is this thing not working? Always trying to figure out like where I could feed community. And I don't think that I was adequately doing that for myself. So like a lot of my experience at Oxford and onwards post Yukon has been really trying to find that balance. What does it look like for me to be able to be a part of these movements, feed my community, and also realize that taking a step back at times to rest is not only a good thing to do, it's a necessity. Community exists so that you can take a step back and other people can still make our worlds go round. That's what an effective community looks like. I always think back to undergrad and I don't necessarily really regret anything. I don't regret most things. I think like everything is a, is a lesson and I'm really grateful in a lot of ways to, I feel like be having so many, I guess, like life-changing reflections so young, cause I feel like that'll be helpful moving forward. But I definitely struggled with balance all throughout college. And it was only the people that really saw me on the day-to-day -day that would know that no one else did. And I come home during Thanksgiving and I would just sleep for 40 days. <laughs> My parents would be like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. And then I like run back to campus. And it's so funny. I'll end with this. I always think about how interesting it is when you meet people in different seasons of your life and how totally. when you reconnect with those people, you're reminded of how far you've come. I, this past weekend went to Baltimore and I saw my sophomore year roommate who was an exchange. Oh, cool from Lebanon, Yana, and we were best friends that year. We just connected so well and we hadn't seen each other for five years. So when we saw each other, she actually met my partner for the first time. And she was just like, wow, I can't believe Wawa has time for you because the Wawa I know was up at 6 a.m. and coming back at 3 a.m. taking showers at 2 a.m. And, you know, it worked out for us. And like, I didn't mind, but I always thought that she was a crazy girl. And he like looked at me and I was laughing and she's like, what's funny? I was like, she doesn't even know that version of me because wow. like, I'm still a hard worker, but the idea of waking up at 6 a.m. and then going to bed at 3 a.m. every yeah. day, which was my reality in college, I don't even think my body could handle that. So here I got tired hearing you say that. So, so interesting because I had forgotten. And when she said it, I was like, wait, you're right. This was what I was doing every day for almost like four years. That's insane. Yeah. That and is not at all something awesome. that I recommend. <laughs> no, no. And we'll talk about that because it seems like you've changed that a lot. And I think it's so important. I want to read a tweet that you put up. 
in November of 2019 when you heard some pretty big news. It reads, just when I think I've run out of tears, they just keep coming. I am a 2020 Rhodes Scholar, the first in Yukon's history, and by the looks of the archives, the first Black person to receive the Rhodes, Truman, and Udell. This is unreal. Mom and Dad, I did it. First and foremost, congratulations. It is so incredible that you hold this honor. And I believe that it is also incredibly, incredibly fitting for you. But I have to say that my attention in that tweet can't help but go directly to how you pay tribute to your mom and dad. Gratitude has been something that I have really relied on as a way to help me find clarity as I navigate this new part of my journey and as I dig deep to really find the person that I am meant to be, I believe that without gratitude, that'll be something that I never even reach. Can you tell us a little bit about kind of that moment, but also why that gratitude came to the surface right away? Ah, oh my goodness. So what's so interesting about that is I'm pretty sure I tweeted that like a day after it happened. So it wasn't a tweet that I sent out that day. That was after I was still just like crying all the time. Like, yeah, like, <laughs> everyone's like, what is going on with that girl? But I mean, to give you some insight on the national scholarships and fellowships realm, it is pretty cutthroat. I mean, obviously uber competitive, but not even cutthroat in the way that it is externally, but just like internally. Oh like yeah, I'm sure. To like fill out an application like that, you need to have spent a lot of time thinking about who you are, why you are, why you want to do what you want to do. And throughout that process, everything kept coming back to my parents. And I already knew that, but that process specifically, just quite literally, when I'd ask myself, why am I who I am? And I would connect different parts of my personality, different things that I want to do, have done. Almost everything, I could literally connect it to either of my parents or one of them. And I was just so constantly reminded in that process of how lucky I was and am to have parents that just love me and my siblings so unconditionally. Yes, we grew up in a very like strict and like protective household, but it was never a question of whether or not my parents loved me and whether or not my parents supported me. And whenever I think about how, well, how did you survive like sleeping three hours a night and putting on concealer and acting like you had a full night of sleep and all these different things and juggling, you know, my personal life and my social life and my academic life and organizing. It's all because of community. Like our tribes are so fundamental and it's really been in reflection of like this moment. And in that moment, I was feeling a lot of that of reflection of, I am literally standing on the backs of my parents and their parents. And then all the other people that have made up my tribe and have supported me in moments where I've like questioned whether or not I'm even deserving. Cause that was another thing. Like a lot of what I was feeling was I mean, even with Rhodes, like you're in a room of, I think it was like 14 people. Like after you do all the interviews, you're all in a room and they come and tell the two winners in a group of people. So, and they said my name second. <laughs> so I heard the first name, not me. Second name, I was like, oh my goodness. So there's but, no waiting? You don't no, wait? Like, no, no, no. Not like, cause I saw a video, I think Rio did that video. Like someone at UConn was telling you about one of the others that was like, that was in person, like from someone at UConn, right? Yes. Rhodes is like, you have the cocktail hour the day before, which isn't a cocktail party. It's like walking yeah. back and you're just like having conversation with folks. The next day is like all day interviews and it lasts as long as the interviews go. Like standard, it's 20 minutes, but it can go over that. I had a second interview that was twice the amount of time as my first interview and not everyone got it. it it's literally just them following up and trying to like, learn more and answer any unanswered questions. Basically, yeah, they brought all the finalists. There were either 14 or 16 of us in total. And all these people that you're bonding over, they're like, well, what you won? So I'm, ah! It was deeply confusing. I was so happy. And the first thing I did do involuntarily was cry. Like I had tears all over. I wanted to call my mom. But then to my left and right, 
other people that are just as qualified, just as passionate, who are absolutely changing the world and will continue to change the world. And I felt a lot of guilt as well in that moment. I think like when I got to the point of like sending that tweet, I was just like in a moment of gratitude and just trying to hold on to multiple things can be true at the same time. All those people were well-deserving, but I also deserved it as well. We all did. Also reflecting on it wasn't Wawa's achievement. It was just as much of my parents' achievement as it was mine and so many other folks in my community because I wouldn't have gotten to that point without them. I love that you have just such gratitude for your parents and just so much unconditional love within your family. I believe that I have a similar makeup. I have two sisters that I love very much and have been two of my biggest critics, biggest fans along the way. My parents, I believe, fall into that same category. I definitely received a lot of love as a child, but I also caused a lot of pain and made a lot of bad decisions that challenged a lot of what family is. And I feel that unconditional love, we spoke about this last time with John Quinones around his mother, Maria, and just the similarity that I saw in my own mom as it applied to my journey with substance. There's one thing about unconditional love with family is that no matter what they do, no matter what they say, no matter how they challenge us in the way in which we are living our lives, you do have to have gratitude for what they've done for you because there's so much of who you are and where you're at that wouldn't even be possible if it wasn't for that unconditional love and support that we receive from our parents and our immediate families. We talked about that family relationship for you. And of course, when you have that family relationship, that unconditional love for the most part comes along with it. And that truly is the first community that you're part of is your family. You talk a lot about community in general, but it's a big part of your climate journey. And so I'd love to hear you talk about how you entered the climate space in a very untraditional way. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I always talk about that. You're right. I'm like, thinking, I think I always say that. <laughs> so essentially, so my parents are both Kikuyu Kenyan. So my tribe in Kenya, we have for you know time immemorial tended to the southern sides of mount kenya to my knowledge like my siblings and i were the first to not you know grow up on a farm and so like that deep relationship with the land was something that was 100 percent passed down to me and i didn't even realize that that's what it was that it was something that was a part of my culture and heritage it was just a part of my life especially growing up my mom she always tells us this story of how she cultivated this garden and this plot in our backyard back in Putnam and how it was just like this weedy allotment and everyone was like, why that her name? Like, you cannot transform that into a garden. She did it. And I grew up spending so much of my time in that garden. Honestly, that's a big part of the area though too, right? Because yeah. Alfred School has like a big agricultural program and all yeah. of that. Yes. So I spent so much of my childhood in the outdoors, like I said before, even just by myself, but in that garden specifically, my mom would use a lot of like the vegetables and different things that she was growing in like the Kenyan cuisine that I grew up eating. I feel like naturally being a part of the quiet corner and growing up there, like it's hard not to have a relationship with the outdoors. It's just so beautiful and pristine. And that's where, you know, I was always a like very shy, introverted person. So I You say that. I don't believe it. I still am. I really still am. I wouldn't say I'm as shy, but I, I'm still an introvert. Being less shy was a thing that happened in college. That was a whole nother conversation. But I always had that experience. But at the same time, because of where I grew up in the quiet corner and because it's an area that people know is just so perfect if you love the outdoors and the environment, I had a very clear understanding of what a mainstream environmentalist was, what they looked like, what they did, how much money they had. And literally in every area, it did not match up with me. <laughs> I grew up watching National Geographic and watching different conservationists, like in the Serengeti, for instance, like in Kenya. I never saw like a Kenyan conservationist, like on the TV screen. Like my friends that were really into like hiking and camping and had families, I would bring them out for trips and stuff that just didn't resonate with my experience. Like we never did that as a kid. So there were just like lifestyle as well as like aesthetic 
understandings of what environmentalism was. And then especially as I was coming into myself and my teens in regards to like social justice and also coming into my positionality as a dark skinned black woman and realizing that the way that people perceive me is just so different from like my classmates and like coming into that in the quiet corner as the only black girl around and coming into social justice issues as well. I would often find myself conflicted of, I really care about the polar bears. I really care about protecting the planet and making sure that we have public land accessible for everyone. But at the same time, like we're also, especially at this time, like 15, 16, you know, we had the murder of Trayvon Martin. All these things are happening at the same time. And I just felt like this doesn't feel like a black issue. I feel like my time could be better used on things that are more immediate to myself and my community. I always talk about this class that I took when I was a junior in environmental science class. And then we had an environmental justice chapter and I decided to dive into learning more about EJ myself, like an extra credit project and just really started to learn from a lot of the elders online, like Peggy Shepard, for instance, I watched her Ted talk and heard her articulate why environmental justice was and is like the biggest threat to black and brown life and why it's so important to have an intersectional lens when it comes to environmental issues. And with that, I really gained this new language of articulating all the frustrations I had had of, oh wait, environmentalism actually is an issue for all of us. And there should be room for all of us in this movement. But why have I been in like the perfect space to be an environmentalist? You know, a lot of the work being done in regards to like pathways to environmentalism. They're like, oh, bring black and brown kids to like the outdoors and that will have the connection there. I had that. So why wasn't that connection there? And a lot of it is because we don't see folks like us engaged in that work in that language of environmental justice and the bridging between social justice, and environmental justice. It isn't always explicitly made, especially like in the big green mainstream environmental spaces. So that upbringing, that experience, and a lot of the frustration that came out of that has really guided my own path, like in the environmental slash climate space. Activism and being an activist has always been something that's been a conversation for me around, you know, what makes someone an activist? You know, do you just wake up someday and say that, oh, I'm passionate about this subject matter, and then you can call yourself an activist? I think that's a little inappropriate, especially when we look at people like David Hogg, who we have on next week, and his work with March for Our Lives and gun violence prevention, you yourself and obviously environmental justice space, Juju Chang when it comes to championing and protecting the API community. You know, you all have done the work, lived this yourself and, and have the personal experience, and then you've mobilized hundreds of thousands of people to move in a direction with you to create change. To me, that's activism. But, you know, how do you define activism? And for our listeners, how can they take the first small step to become an activist? And then also, you know, knowing that we have multiple generations of people that are listening in, how do young people in Gen Z work with older generations around things like climate change and gun violence? How are you able to have a seat at the table, but then also work with others that maybe feel a little bit differently or have experienced different moments of history that have led them to believe the things they believe. How do you work with people in the boomer generation and other generations to create change that is going to last far after they're gone and be around in the life as you get older and just be a foundation for other generations to pick up on the activism fight where you leave off? Ah, so, you know, what? I'm going to answer that backwards because I think it'll be easier for me. Cool. People ask me this all the time, especially since there was this like New York Times article on like, okay, Doomer. It was someone like online was talking about, there was like this term is like, a play on okay, Boomer, but specifically like playing into like, a generational divide in regards to like climate apathy and like older generations being more of, this is an issue for young people to deal with. Like we will not be around when in 2050 or 2100, where all these projections are saying that the earth, if we don't act in certain ways, might really look like and be like, and those conditions being uninhabitable, et cetera. And speaking from my own experience, I have not experienced that. I have yet to really be in a situation where I feel like there is a generational divide 
on the topic of like climate denialism or climate doomism in the climate space. And I'd argue for any social movement really is like, it's not like this work is new. Like, yes, the issue of climate change in its intensity being what it is, is new, but the concept of environmental issues and environmental organizing is not new at all. And I mean, Jane Goodall, like, come on, she's like uh, yeah. the mother. <laughs> right. And a lot of the elders in the environmental movement and specifically environmental justice movement, they are still alive and kicking, you know, Dr. Robert Bullard, Gina McCarthy. Gina McCarthy, you know, so many trailblazers. And to be honest, I think there is a general understanding, especially within the youth climate space, that we have to work alongside our elders because they have been doing the work for so long. And it doesn't make sense to attempt to reinvent the wheel. Instead, we should be working together to try to find out what are some of the skill sets that we might have generationally. I mean, like Gen Z, we know how to work online. We know how to organize online. For the elders that I work alongside that might be in their 60s or 70s, they may not be as savvy in that regards, but boy, do they know a thing or two about holding a sit-in somewhere. They know how to organize marches. They know how to organize across movements. And there's so much to learn from different generations. And I feel like that's important to bring up just because I really don't think that, especially in regards to like the climate movement and um, ensuring that we are facilitating a space that can solve this issue, we need everybody involved. The other thing I'll say is particularly in the climate space, I think a lot of the way that people talk about climate in the media, especially from a journalistic point of view, isn't where it should be because there aren't a lot of climate people that are in those spaces and I'll explain why. So oftentimes people talk about this generational divide within the climate movement of like climate activists, youth climate activists pointing to the older generation and being like, why didn't you step in? When in the reality, we know that it wasn't your average Joe that led us to these situations. I know that my parents and my grandparents did not contribute to the climate crisis. They were attending on a farm in Kenya. My friends who have been here since like the Mayflower, their grandparents were just like working class citizens that were trying to make enough money to survive the end of the month. Those are not the people that led us to the point that we are in. We are here because of the industries and governments that have continued to ignore the science that has told us that certain industries like the fossil fuel industry, which has known since the 1950s, that their practices and unrealistic growth mindset has led us to a situation where we have emitted so many greenhouse gases that our planet is quite literally changing. Yeah. At a point where we need to step in and actually reduce our emissions and reduce a lot of the unregulated growth that we're seeing all over the place. So I think like genuinely people within the movement know that it's not you know, a random grandparent or parent, I think it's unfortunate that there's so much time put in online talking about the generational divides. Because if you look at the people doing the work, we all work in tandem with each other. And those are, those are our family, our chosen family. So I, I really wanted to put that out there. And in regards to like, how does one become an activist? I'm less concerned with like the terminology of who an activist is and who an activist isn't. I just want to know like, are your intentions about building up community, facilitating space for yourself and others, and specifically focusing your unique sphere of influence to make a change in your community? If that intention is there, then already you have the tools and the unique tools to do that. I think that a lot of times people think that in order to be an effective activist or change maker, you need to be this like really outgoing person that, you know, marches on the streets with like a fist in the air and you know, a loudspeaker. And that's definitely a valid way. I mean, those are a lot of the visible folks, but there are so many people that actually aren't as visible that do just as much work. Activism takes form in so many different ways. Being a caretaker is a form of activism. When you go to a climate march, like the climate march are happening in New York City next month, there are different caretakers that are, you know, standing on the side, making sure that everyone's okay. If someone passes out, being a first aid person, that is a caretaker. When you think about a climate disaster and folks that come in to take care of people that are really at the front lines, 
that person is a climate activist. They are using their unique skills and their ability to take care of people and animals and flora and fauna in the face of disaster. That is a very valid set of expertise that is needed. We need teachers that are going to be able to support kids that are experiencing climate anxiety, which we already know is happening. There's countless polls that are coming out that says kids as young as six years old are thinking about climate change on the day to day because they're realizing and people are talking about this so much that it's really their lives that are in their lifetimes now even that a lot of these things are happening and we need teachers to understand. We need therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists that are well equipped to support people that are going through these things. So I would say like, as long as the intention is there bringing, and it doesn't have to be climate, right? Any issue needs people at every angle, because what we're looking for is systems changes, right? And in order to shift our system, to be in a place where we have gender equity, to be in a place where we have a livable climate future, we need every aspect of community to be playing in. So you don't have to be looking for new ways to get involved. You can start where you're at. It can be in your workplace, it can be in your group chat, it can be in your household. Bringing people together over a different cause and framing in a way that makes sense to them due to your proximity to them is some of like the best work that you can do. Thank you for sharing that because I agree with you 100%. And I really believe that it's not just activism that that holds true for. It's also anything that we're putting our time into. We can all do anything we want to do. But if we don't care about it and if we don't feel as if it's really important to find that passion and that fire for it, it's never sustainable. And I also think that too many people feel that if they don't have a degree in a certain subject matter, or if they haven't worked in an industry for a certain amount of time, that they are then not welcome in a community that is meant to create change. Activism communities should never be communities that are only letting people into them if they check certain boxes. I believe that, you know, if you want to wake up one day and you want to bring everything that you are to a certain cause or a subject area, then you should be able to do so. And you should be able to feel confident that you're bringing the skills and the experiences that you've had in your life to the table and that you're going to bring those, you know, to the forefront in a way that is going to impact the organization and help create the change that everyone is committed to seeing. And so it really definitely is that idea that anyone can be an activist and that you really just have to care about what's in front of you and be passionate about the cause to fit in. So as an activist, you are always being pushed in so many different directions and you are constantly seeing the highs and lows of doing this type of work. How do you refuel yourself and how do you practice self-care to allow you to continue to do the work? Yes. So there is a quote in the book, All We Can Save, and they talk about how a burnout person can't save a burning planet. And I remember Ooh. first hearing that and I was like, that is absolutely right. If I am burnt out, how can I expect that any of the work that I'm doing won't replicate the very dynamics that led me here? And every time I feel like I'm on a path to burning myself out, I have to remind myself of that. And then also just lean back on something that I had said earlier. The whole point of community is that we can have self-sustaining movements. No movement should be reliant on one individual or group of people. Movements exist because of all the different people lifting it up. So if I need to take a step back and have a self-care day, week, or God forbid month, I should be able to do that and the movement should be able to sustain. It's supposed to be able to sustain because that's a natural part of life. Like rest is so important. And the other thing is, and this is something that I talk a lot about with my, we call our, each other like climate comrades, just our friends that also do climate, yeah. is realizing how important it is to infuse joy in everything that you do. I feel like we burn out because the conditions that we are in, I think in a lot of organizing and activist spaces, because there is so much urgency, we're not thinking about nourishing ourselves in the moment because sometimes it's not as seen as time effective or as resource effective. But what if we flip it and say like, what if we are constantly nourishing ourselves 
and having nourishing spaces so that the work that we're doing is inherently nourishing and that we're enjoying our time with each other and beginning to, in our activist and organizing spaces, replicating all the dynamics of the world we're building towards. And I think like that has been so important for me where in a lot of ways started to break away from the ideas of what I thought an activist or organizer or a leader had to be. I always thought that those folks have to be like really stoic all the time and sometimes void of personality. I don't know why I had that vision. In a lot of ways, sometimes I struggle with this at UConn uh, where I'd be in leadership roles and I'd be like, wow, I just seem more serious than you are. And anyone that knows me knows that, you know, there's a time for everything, but I really am like a really playful, joyful person in general. And a lot of times I felt like this isn't the space for it. And now looking back, I'm like, no, this is actually one of the most important times to have joy. When you're doing like, for instance, like any type of social movement organizing, the conditions that have led anyone into that space oftentimes are from a survival mindset or from a like existential mindset. I mean, a lot of people that get involved in climate, myself in included, we get involved because we're like, we're sick and tired of the decision makers of the world, the governments, institutions, not taking this issue seriously. And we want to have a role to play in that space. When you think of all these people that are coming to the space and a lot of times feeling really low, that should be the place where you should be infused with joy and infused with, you know, laughter and dance and song. And that's why in a lot of ways I have leaned so much into creative climate work because I'm realizing that there is a place for us to have to engage with all the different creative endeavors that make people people. I think that the arts, for instance, are such a perfect place for climate organizing and organizing in general. I mean, that is where we truly express ourselves through song, through written expression, whether it's spoken word, whether it's poems, whether it's artwork, whether it's through playing an instrument. Is that not a perfect place to express how you're feeling about the planet and also express why you're doing the work that you're doing and even express what you want to build? That has played a huge role in like where I see myself going in the climate space and where I am now. And it's really just completely transformed my relationship with like organizing and has made it a lot more healthy. Yeah. Awesome. I love that. I feel like that just kind of encompassed everything. So we are now on to our final part of the podcast. It is our takeaway 10. The takeaway 10 are 10 questions that I ask each guest that come on. Let's get started. What always makes you laugh? Always makes you laugh. My cat, Curious George. I love that. Oh, I love the name too. If you could ask one person one question, who would it be and what would you ask? I would ask my great, great grandmother how she met my great, great grandfather. Oh, I love that. That is so cool. What advice do you have for young people entering the workplace or just a new step in their life in general? Know your boundaries and know how to communicate keeping them. So important. How should we measure our lives in years, in moments, in accomplishments, or something else? Moments, always. Moments, super important. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It's super what we talk about on this too. It's, I mean, the small steps, the small moments, so important to just kind of cherish them and, and really let them build out your legacy, right? And, and the things that you want to be remembered for. Name one thing about yourself that you will never change. I'll never change being awkward. <laughs> <laughs> see, I don't see this, but like you swear by it. So I take it for truth. If you could, would you really want to live a life that is free from challenges or obstacles? No, I wouldn't. Reason why? I think our obstacles and challenges teach us more about ourselves than our successes. Which three people, past or present, would you invite to a dinner party? I would say Issa Rae for all three so that she knows, but Issa Rae, ooh, Nelson Mandela, and then like my great-great-grandmother. Oh, that's awesome. Wow. Great-great-grams is getting a lot of like plug right now. <laughs> huh. So you said this word a lot during the episode, so I actually, and I think you may have actually answered this question, but it'll be good to repeat, but how do you define a community and are you part of one? I think we know the end of that truly, but how do you define a community? 
I define community as your squad, people that are willing to grow with you alongside you and are just invested in like building, building a better world for us all. And am I a part of community? Yes, many. Totally. Have you ever looked in the mirror and not recognized the person staring back? Yes. Uh, after surgery. <laughs> I'm like... <laughs> You can only imagine. Very literal situation. I didn't recognize myself outside of that context. Yes. I think there are moments where I look at myself in the mirror and I realize that I look older than I remembered. I'm just like, oh, I'm, I'm a young adult. I'm not 13 anymore. Yeah. I, and, you know, not to get off script, but to just say that it's such a hard thing when you do things at a young age that are looked at as important or as like successful because there is that imposter syndrome, but then there's also people that look at you and are like, yeah, but you got a lot of life to live. And I like hate it. So I totally hear you because when you do look at yourself, you should be proud of yourself, but also it's natural to just kind of notice those things around like, oh, I'm an adult or like, oh, this looks different today because what we see ourselves is so different than what others see in us. And I, I think it's super important. Last question. What are you grateful for in this moment? I am grateful that I get to lean into my creative side. I think that's something that I suppressed for a really long time. And I'm really grateful to be at a point in my life where I'm not embarrassed by those things. And I get to combine it with other passions. Thank you so much for joining us today, Wawa. It was an absolute privilege to have you on the podcast. To the Small Steps listeners, thank you so much for joining us again. I hope that you learned a lot today, and I hope you see that community is so important in our lives. And if we can rally around each other and turn to the power of people, we can do anything. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode of the Small Steps Big Change Podcast. I hope that this episode inspired you to let go of whatever is holding you back and take the first small step. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, follow our YouTube channel, The Small Steps Big Change Podcast, and connect with me on Instagram. Remember, no matter what you are going through, without taking small steps, you are limiting your potential to create big change. So take that first small step today. I promise you that you won't regret it.